out no swain, man. I was trying to give the world back a hug. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Oof, well, let me get used to these lights. Um, it's great to be back, man. Like I, I didn't know it was so rare for me to come back and come back on stage, being reinvited back here to Austin this fest. Because um, it's not often I get to be part of a um, tribe of sorts to talk about personal growth. I spend most of the year um, at conferences and in meetings with entrepreneurs. They were always talking about growing businesses. Whether it's talking about raising money or getting a fundraising strategy right, or how do you spend money that you've raised to create more, to get more customers, create more traction, or it's talking about business. So I am excited to be back here to, well, pretty much talk about the same thing. <laughs> but what you start to realize is that um, growing businesses that create a lot of results in your business has everything to do with personal growth. It's so interrelated and it's so strange that sometimes people disconnect two things. They disconnect personal growth and they disconnect money as though they're two separate things. But what you start to see from um, what I'll share with you today is that both of them are extremely interrelated. Let me show you something. You guys, anyone know who this woman is? Yeah, Sarah, Sarah Blakely. She's the um, uh, Forbes billionaire's the youngest self-made woman in Forbes billionaire list. So um, her backstory, I mean, for a, lot of, um, um, for a lot of you who know, she created this type of a sh form wear, I think it's called shape wear, where it's underwear that accentuates your ass or your hips or any part of your body makes it look really good. Um, and uh, as you can tell, like, I've been using their level 10 advanced product and it's, uh, it, wor it works wonders, I tell you. I'm th I mean, this woman, her billion dollar idea literally came out of her ass. Think about that. But here's why I'm introducing you to her. In the Forbes uh, Billionaire's interview, she was asked, what is it like to become a billionaire in a very short amount of time? And she, and, and she was asked, how did it change you? Now she said, I feel like money makes you more of who you already are. If you're an asshole, you become a bigger asshole. If you're nice, you become nicer. And I mean, I've, <laughs> I've worked with Founders who uh, literally became mil millionaires, as such multimillionaires in the span of like under two years. And like I've met people um, uh, from different ranges and I, I, I can attest that this is actually very, very true. Um, so what I'd like to talk about here today, um, it blends into personal growth, it blends into business, um, but it's a bit of an exercise. I'm going to share things with you that imagine if you're going to get flushed with cash over in the next 30 minutes. By the end of this talk, I want to see whether you guys are huge assholes or not. Obviously, a big asshole walking around. You know, you know what's going down. <laughs> so, um, for those of you who are um, here last year, I spoke about getting unstuck, and my fundamental um, insight with a lot of business creation and rapidly accelerating results is that a lot of the times you may work with someone who's uh, coming from a point where they're eating sand every day, right? Like I, um, I met a uh, Mar Martin. You hear Martin? I was talking to Martin last night, and he lives in seven ringgit a day right now because he's like saving up all the money for his current startup. So sometimes you come from a point where like you don't have much, and you're just fighting to grow. But for a lot of us, all of us have great results in our lives. Right now, you guys are here at Awesomeness Fest. You guys are smiling. The energy is great. Last night's dance party was through the roof. Like you guys are happy. You guys are healthy. You guys are wealthy in so many ways, and that makes it even harder to get to the next level. Because you're so comfortable, you're seeing everything you want in your life, and you know when you're a little bit more. How would you break out from a comfort zone if it's the best damn comfort zone that you have that you spend years to build? Now, that's hard. So could you say that you're stuck? Maybe. Last year, I introduced three tools at three distinct phases of creation process. The first phase is that when you're stuck with producing your idea. The next phase is when you're stuck with assembling a team, getting the right team on board. And the third tool was when you already have a company and you want it to run more autonomously without you. So those three tools um, is available on YouTube. Um, you can also go to Kylie.com, like the link to the videos there. Um, what I want to talk about today about getting unstuck is more like a prelude of sorts. I mean, I thought about it. Okay, great. You know you're stuck. You need these tools to get unstuck. But what if you don't know you're stuck? What if you spend six months or to a year thinking you're making progress, and then you wake up and say, wait a minute, I have made no progress in my life. I've been thinking about things, I've been trying things, I've been doing things, but you look back, the results are the same. You look at your bank account, it's the same balance you had two years ago. Did you think you were stuck? 
Maybe you didn't. Maybe nobody told you. Maybe you haven't told yourself. So I started to think a little bit about how do you know when you're stuck? Because if you can know you're stuck, you didn't have to wait two years to know you're stuck and do something about it, and somebody could have told you, or you could have told yourself maybe in two weeks, you would have saved an entire year and 50 more weeks, right? A year and 50 weeks, that's, yeah, it's like 100, 102 weeks. So <laughs> you would have spent 102 weeks of your life, right? All because you knew a little bit earlier. So um, I'm going to talk about three tools to detect um, when you're stuck. And I'm going to do this by telling you three stories in my life. Now, the first one, um, yeah, so I'm going to share with you three signals. Um, what signal would tell you that you might be stuck and what can you do about it? I'm going to share three stories. Now, the first story, this first story is called, It's Not My Job. Um, when I was 15 years old, um, a lot of my friends and I, we came from a government high school, SMK Daman Sarajaya, I know some high school mates here. <laughs> We've... Um, so a lot of my friends were talking about getting part-time jobs because when you hit age 16 in Malaysia, it's legal for you to get a part-time job. Um, so I was 15, friends were talking about it. We were saying, okay, what if you worked at Starbucks, man? It's kind of cool. You get a four ringgits an hour, it's not bad. Oh, but you could fold clothes at this other shop and get four ringgit 50 cents an hour. Ha ha, 50 cents more an hour, that's great. And there's this other friend whose older brother built a, 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 a flash intro. That kind of reveals my age, but yeah. So he built a flash intro and, um, and charged 60,000 Sing dollars, which is about 50,000 US dollars to build a flash intro. Two weeks of work, 50,000 US dollars. And that kid was like 17 years old. So I'm like, why am I trying to get four ringgit an hour, which is about a dollar, 50 cents US dollars an hour, when I could work two weeks and get 50,000 US dollars? I need to learn this shit. So <laughs> me and my friends were like, okay, let's learn how to build websites, man. So we, we sat, we just spent nights, right, on the internet, you know, instead of our alternative activities, we instead learned how to build websites. And um, over uh, that course of time, it became part of my identity as someone who understood the web, someone who understood the internet. And I would spend um, 15, all the way till I was 21 years old, building websites for people. And that's how I made uh, a bit of my, uh, uh, my side income. So it became part of me that I was good at this. And I really prided myself in being a web designer, a web developer. Eventually, I picked up some front-end development, and I worked with a lot of other programmers to get things done. And I found that that was such a good skill, because in a world where people don't understand much of technology, people want to get their ideas built, I felt very special. I felt like, wow, I had something to offer, and I was paid good money to do it. So it became part of my identity. When I joined Vision to work in Mindvalley, um, to refresh his memory, no, I'm <laughs> I spent a lot of times also building out a lot of web projects. Like Vision and the rest of them may have a lot of ideas and translating those ideas into actual products people use, um, interfacing between designers and developers. I played a key role in a lot of those things. So when I left, naturally, I was looking for business partners who could do business operations, management, sales, stuff that required me to get off the computer. And um, I found a business partner, his name's Joel, and he's fantastic at it. And, it was, um, and we started building businesses together. Now, at this point, I was still with that mindset that I'm Kylie, like the technology guy. I'm Kylie, the web designer, the web developer. Like, that's who I am. And it came one day uh, in the journey of building my first business where things were not going very well at all. But we had one shot at this deal that Joel had been putting together. It would be a very, very big deal with a huge organization. If we get this deal, it would mean we wouldn't have to raise outside funding and we could fund ourselves for another 10 months, pay salaries and keep growing for another 10 months. So naturally, this deal meant a lot to Joel. And of course, it meant a lot to me. We had spent two months, two whole months preparing for this deal. And when, push come to sh when, when uh, the decision day came, there was this final presentation. Joel, who had been doing all the sales by the time, said, Kylie, they, they might be asking some tough questions, especially if it gets technical. I'm going to need you to come with me. So I'm like, yeah, you know, but I'm the tech guy, man. I'm not going to go on a sales call. Sales is not my job. Like, you, you go and sell. That's why I work with you, man, so I can do the web stuff. You do the sales stuff, right? She's like, come on, dude. What if you ask me these kind of questions? I'm going to need your help. I'm like, OK, I'll just go to a few questions, all right? I'm going to bring my laptop with me. <laughs> so I go in the meeting room, covering my face with my laptop, sitting down there, and then the meeting begins. Joel presents. He presents and he presents. At this point, I peer beyond my laptop, and I realized that this was no ordinary meeting. This was a meeting where you've got a boardroom, and the people around the board table, and then there are seats on the side of the boardroom. 
So I was kind of, wait a minute, there's like 30 people in this meeting. Like the boardroom board room tables aren't even big enough for all of them, just taking them aside. Sounds really important. So then, and Joel is presenting, okay, finished presenting, and it opened up the Q&A. They're asking him some questions, some of which like Joel directed the questions to me. I was like, oh yeah, I'm the smart tech guy and I know all the answers, so I'm gonna answer everything like I'm so smart, right? I'm answering all these smart things. And um, so they asked me more and more questions. So being like a straightforward geek guy, I just gave really straightforward answers. Now at the end of the meeting, I walked out of the room feeling really smug. I was like, well, I can, yeah, this, that was a pretty good meeting. Joel said, hey, how do you think, we, how do you think that, that meeting went? I said, that was a really good meeting. Did you see all the questions they were, ans- they were, they were asking? And see how, like, you see how we answered all those questions? You saw, I answered those questions. It was great. You know, I think we got the deal. Joel said, we lost it. What, what do you mean we lost it? I said, the reason why they're asking those questions was because they're trying to suggest that they already have existing solutions which is very similar to the solution we have. They're trying to show the board that they didn't need our solution. We lost it. Okay, so we walk out, go into the car, and then we drive back. And it's a long drive back, so a 45-minute drive back. We drive in, Joel's quiet. He may be pissed at me, I don't know. I'm sitting there, I'm like telling myself, fuck man, sales. I will never do sales again. I'm a, I'm a geek, man. I'm a tech guy. What the hell am I doing in a sales meeting? Joel should just win on his own, man. Like, it's, it's not my job, man. But at the same time, I felt so guilty. You know, I, I really screwed this up. And I started thinking about what's going to happen in the next 10 months. You know, what, what's going to be our next source of revenue? Like, are we going to be able to find funding? And, we're, and like, how's Joel feel about all this, man? And I, and I just broke down and I cried. It's like, I really screwed months of work up and I cried and I cried and I cried. So we're driving it back and I'm crying and Joel started like semi-freaking out. I was like, dude, wait, bro, bro, hey, shit. And he turned up the music and just like, okay. <laughs> it's not happening, man, not happening, man. <laughs> it's cold for having a mental breakdown, it's so dark, man. So I was, I was done, I was de- probably dehydrated by the end of that process, right? <laughs> I want to have some chicken rice, right? So we're eating the same seven ringgit meal you were having, man. So we're eating some chicken rice, getting our shit cha, our Chinese tea, and we're eating. And uh, so Joel says, um, Joel breaks the silence and says, Kylie, if you don't want to do sales, I'll never make you go to a sales meeting again. Okay? We'll, we'll never have to pay you that again. And I kept quiet. I was like, I just didn't talk to you. I was just eating. I was thinking about it. And he said, but if you want to join me, Go to sales call tomorrow, then we can learn how to do it better together. I was like, okay. All right. So I put down, I finished my chicken rice. I said, all right, let's do it. Let's go. Now, that decision alone of a willingness to evolve beyond the identity of being a technology guy to starting to learn sales put me on a process which transformed my life forever. Being like fundamentally still a really geeky guy, the first thing I did that night was Google how to do sales, right? <laughs> so I'm like Googling that shit, right? And I was Googling, reading up, reading everything I can. And I found that a lot of the um, stuff at, um, I don't know why I didn't sit well with a lot of the material I read, but I came across this one blog post about a, div- a programmer who's actually had to do a lot of, uh, they call it, Google calls them sales engineers, right? They're salespeople, but they're fundamentally programmers. And he talked about how selling is essentially sharing what you believe in. I was like, hey, I can relate to that. I can share what I believe in. And uh, from a lot of those things, I started doing more, uh, more and more sales stuff. Um, it came to a point where uh, we invented another type of business, a different way of monetizing our news website, sales.com. It was like a very, very new way of monetizing it. Um, Joel at the time was uh, in charge of another business unit that we set up. So I had to do all the sales myself. Um, so in 10 months, I went out and I closed 70 of Malaysia's largest advertisers, billing uh, 350,000 US dollars of revenue in 10 months. Um, towards the last month, I got one extra salesperson to assist me. But when I look back on that first year um, versus the time I went for that, um, that sales meeting, I said, wow, like, am I a salesperson now? Like, did I just pick up this new skill? And with that story alone, I kind of felt that every time I um, approach a problem and I have something that I don't know how to do, I feel I can learn it, I feel I can do it. And even if I don't, I feel I can find somebody to do it because I can relate, I can appreciate that. However, what it means to a lot of other entrepreneurs that I work with. They would say things like, oh, fundraising, I hate fundraising, man. It's such a pain, such a bitch to talk to investors. You know, I should be building my business. Fundraising, that's not my job. 
oh, I got this CFO guy that I brought along. You know, he can do that. Or some people, they'll be afraid of technology. They'll be like, I have all these ideas, but, you know, I just can't get technology, man. I just, I'm not a programmer. Just look at me, man. Can I program? No, I hate, I, hate, I hate technology. I need to find somebody else to do it for me, which is fair. We live in a world where people tell you to focus on your strengths, but that does not mean that you have to have an active aversion for key aspects of your business, which is so fundamental to help you realize your dreams. It doesn't mean you have to avoid it, and it doesn't mean that you've got to keep repeating yourself, not my job, that's not my job, that's not my job, like I did. So story number one, to detect you're stuck, if you have a language of repetitive avoidance, if you keep repeating to yourself to avoid something, to avoid something, to avoid something, not my job, I don't want to do this, somebody else should be doing it, I don't want to know about it, I don't want to hear about it, oh finance, I don't hear about it, man, I'm not an accountant, I don't care. The language of repetitive avoidance. If you hear yourself speaking this language to other people, speaking it to yourself, you need to make a change. You don't have to do it yourself, you don't have to be an accountant yourself, but you gotta at least love this shit. You're like, wow, accounting's really important, man. Like, like no wonder all my money is missing, right? Like, I need to get some accounting done. How am I gonna file my taxes? <laughs> like this stuff's important, man. In fact, like a lot of um, some other like what you may what you may or may not know is that it's a lot of very powerful entrepreneurs. Their backgrounds in accounting. Like, you think it's marketing a business? Tony Fernandez was an accountant. Patrick Grove was an accountant. All these guys they built billion dollar enterprises out of Malaysia. They're all accountants. Um, so. Okay, so that's kind of like the first detection. When you avoid something and you say it's not my job. And what you need to do is you need to grow an active uh, affinity for it so you can attract the best talent and the best people to do it. And they feel very appreciated working with you because you understand, you feel, and you appreciate what they do and you, you feel how it's very important. So next story. Oh, wait a minute. There's an exercise. Woohoo! So you guys probably guessed it. If you guys, you probably already know this. You don't even have to write it down. But if there's one role, a job, or a skill that you've been avoiding or loathing, it may be the one that's keeping you stuck. So you write it down, you embrace it. Learn to love it. Learn to appreciate it so you can get the best people in the world to do it. Who knows, you may do it yourself and you may discover that you're really good at it. Story number two. Now I'm gonna share with you story number two to reveal the second signal, the second tool to de detect whether or not you're stuck. So this story is called, Can You Help Me? So midway through my journey, we had to hire, um, okay, not midway, this is kind of like the earlier part of the journey where we had to build a more sophisticated web product. So this is not just building a website, we had to build like a web application. So I am not an application developer, but I loved application development enough to understand that Ruby on Rails is a great language to get this done. Um, at the time, it was still kind of early, earlier uh, in its adoption as a programming language. So only the kind of cool kids in, for geeks, I guess, <laughs> liked Ruby on Rails. Um, I guess most kids didn't think Ruby on Rails was any cool, uh, cool at all. But you know, if you're a geek, Ruby on Rails is basically a cool thing. So I was like, all right, we're gonna find a Ruby on Rails developer. We, I went to events uh, in Malaysia to find these programmers. And for those of you in business, you guys know how hard it is to get programmers in general, not even Ruby on Rails. So I go to a lot of these events and try to find developers. I couldn't hire any of them. They're all busy with projects or whatnot. So I organized events to lure more programmers to me so I could make offers and try to hire more of them. What I started to realize was people did a lot of PHP, but nobody did Ruby on Rails until I met Kamal. Now, oh, Kamal, you're a bona fide Ruby on Rails developer. He's like, yes, I've been building on Ruby on Rails for the past three years. Back before it was cool, I'm like, whoa, that's really cool. <laughs> so um, I got this project, right? So I tried to hire him. And by Kamal, I mean, he's in great demand. He's the only Ruby on Rails developer in Malaysia at the time. Of course, he's in great freaking demand. So he, he didn't want to do stuff for me. I had to pay top dollar just for him to work two weeks with me to build the first version on the product. He built it. It was great. We launched it with a couple of thousand users. It was a great product. And then I went back to come out, come out. I need to change this feature. I think we kind of need the sign up process to be more like that. He's like, sorry, busy. You're on your own now. I was like, what? You just can't leave me with this Ruby and Rose application and not help me. Come on, dude. So I went back to my events. I went back talking to people. I went back trying to hire people. But everybody did PHP. I'm standing there for three months with a product that can't evolve. And I was on the age of learning Ruby and Rose myself. But that was when I kind of decided that maybe I need to switch the conversation up a little bit. Let me talk to Kamal to see what else is going on. I said, Kamal, you said there are no other Ruby and Rails developers in Malaysia. He said, that's right. I'm like, so why not you 
tell me if anyone is learning Ruby on Rails right now, actively learning it. So come on, sit. There's this one guy. His name's Isaac. Go talk to Isaac. I hunt Isaac down. I'm like, Isaac, I heard you're learning Ruby on Rails. I know you're probably half baked, probably half assed, but I will pay you to build my app. <laughs> He's like, yeah, but I'm kind of busy. I have all these jobs, these projects. You know what I mean? You're not, you don't even offering me that much money. I don't, I don't think I want to do it. And I, I was courting Izad. I kind of became his friend. Invited him to parties. You know what I mean? I did, I did everything, man. I just never looked around developer. Give it to me. <laughs> so, 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 months, okay, months of pain just to get a developer. In the end, uh, Izad just flat out rejected me. He said, Kylie, I just can't build it for you yet. I'm still learning Ruby on Rails, and I want to do my thing. I was like, okay, okay, okay. I'm gonna pay you to learn Ruby on Rails. I'm gonna pay you to just sit down and learn it on your own. And here's a PHP developer I met whose name is Arzumi. He wants to learn Ruby on Rails. I'm gonna pay you to learn with him. You're gonna learn together in this little classroom and you just don't build anything for me. I'm just gonna pay you just to learn it. <laughs> just take this app out, John, go and learn it. And, and while I'm gonna learn it, I also have this app which you can learn on. And <laughs> 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 Fast forward a couple of years later, um, Kamal, uh, became, uh, Kamal became the uh, head of engineering at a company called Viki. Viki is a company that 500 startups we invested in uh, two years ago. Viki is one of um, Southeast Asia's um, success stories as far as startup exists concerned. They built a, um, a Korean entertainment translation kind of platform, kind of like a Hulu, but with a lot of K-pop stuff. Translated into 80 languages. They were sold to Rakuten a couple of months ago for 200 million US dollars. Right? So Kamal became the lead engineer. Isa, he went on to build a lot of interesting things. Most notably, is an app you guys might know, it's called Facebook. So he was in the growth and engagement team, building a lot of the friend requests and friend partners, just a very senior engineer uh, in Facebook. Arzumi went on to uh, become the CTO for most of my companies, helping me build groups more, sales.com, and a lot of other apps. Arzumi trained an intern called Edmund. Edmund became the CTO of another company called iMoney, which I invested in, which is one of the top performing companies in my portfolio. And um, the trickle down effect from just the one decision to invest in a few people's learning created a generation of technologists that laid the foundation for major success. So what just happened there? If you find yourself doing the same things over and over again, expecting a different result, there's like a cliche quote, they call it insanity, but you don't have to dramatize it that much. It just means you're kind of stuck. It's like you're playing Street Fighter and all the keys are broken, there's only light punch. It's just, you're trying to, you're trying to, like the big boss is like kicking your ass. Oh, you're like, ah, oh, come on, don't kill me, please, right? You gotta try different moves, man. <laughs> you gotta try some new moves. <laughs> So if you're getting the same old results in your life and you're sitting there just with the only, you got a one hand light punch, like what have you been doing to produce those results? Write that down. You may be repeating this for weeks, maybe years, and you're thinking that that's gonna give you new results. Well, guess what? It's not. It's kind of expired itself. If I went around trying to hire programmers, hire, hire, give me what I want, give me what I want, I could be still stuck there at events talking to you guys. Are you a programmer? Right, so trying to hire, like program you guys. I have to hire you guys, right? So instead, like I switched, I switched it up. I'm like, I want to try something crazy. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna pay them to learn. So think about it. What are you doing now that you repeatedly do over and over again, and you're hoping it's gonna give you a different result, but it's not. Write that down, and you think of one crazy experiment to try. You might just crash and burn and fail, and that's probably gonna be humorous to some degree, but. Um, it could also be very successful for you. So that's the second thing. It's in your actions. You keep doing the same things and you're getting similar results, so you need to try something else. So I've covered two ways to detect that you're stuck. One's in your language and one's in your actions. I will share with you a third story, share with you a third tool, a third signal. This story is called, Our Vision Is. So, in the earlier part of my, um, of my business, I found that the vision for my company kept changing every two weeks. <laughs> part and parcel is because it's a function of me not knowing what the hell I was doing. 
But on the other hand, it's like there's always new things to build, there's new ways ideas can develop. The more I launch it out there and talk to customers, talk to other uh, uh, entrepreneurs, is that there are always new ideas, new directions to bring the business to. And, and I would always be like, oh, yeah, so one moment I'm like this community company, next moment I'm like this research company, next moment. So my vision kept evolving. So when it got to a point where um, our social news product was really mature, I was like, finally, we stuck to the same vision for my company for like a few months. And I felt so comfortable about it. I'm like, we're a social news network. We help, <clears throat> we help the, the, the uh, biggest stories travel through social media. We have a community of half a million social media users who help not just like public stories, but advertiser stories travel as well. So we're a social news network. I was so happy. I felt that I, I did service to my employees because they wouldn't feel so lost. Like I felt like I could tell them something with certainty and that felt really good. I felt like I, I, um, I, I, I got to a point where this vision is finally getting real. I didn't have to change it around so much. And so I stuck to it. I stuck to my goals. I stuck to my vision. There's this thing in my mind of what my company is. I stuck to it. The first year from 300,000 uh, US dollars in revenue, we, we ramped that stuff up to 1.2 million US dollars and we just kept growing. Second year, third year, we kept growing. Then the growth started to slow. And we are working harder than we've ever worked. We're trying more things than we've ever tried, but growth started to slow. And at this point, I'm not going to wait till we started to lose money before I made a, you know, started to turn things around. I started to sit down, literally sit down. I'm going to sit down, right? <laughs> I literally sat down and said, what's going on? I have stuck to my vision for the past two years and I've grown it to this point and growth is starting to slow. What is wrong? I took a step back and I said, fine, fine, fine. S screw my vision, man. What's the bigger picture of what I'm doing? So I'm a social news network, so what? What's going on in this world right now? Okay, media. We're getting advertiser dollars. So we're essentially kind of like a media company. And to be a big media-related company, because social media is just media. So what, how do you become a big media company? How are the biggest media companies built? So I started Googling again. Uh, <laughs> I discovered that there was um, every 10 years, the media industry goes through a period of consolidation. So it happened, in, it started in the US in the 60s, uh, where uh, Time Warner started grouping up a lot of media companies into a larger group. Uh, News Corp did the same, Viacom. Uh, closer to home in Asia, uh, uh, the SAR group started doing it. In Singapore, SPH was doing it. Every 10 years, you just group the media companies together to become larger. I thought, oh. So the way to become a huge media conglomerate is by grouping a lot of smaller guys together. I didn't think about that. But I'm a social news network. What have I got to do with grouping companies together? Unless I'm not a social news network, unless I'm a media giant, unless I'm a new media giant, unless I'm a revolutionary media company. Okay, that's an idea. Wow, I've got to change my vision again. Okay, for once I have a vision and, and now I've got to change it again. Okay, great. So if I were to pursue this new vision of being the largest consolidated digital media company in all of Southeast Asia, how am I going to do that? So that idea set me on a path. I talked to Patrick Grove, one of the uh, Vision and I, one of our close friends as well. He's built a portfolio of one and a half billion US dollars worth of three companies in six years. And uh, he does it because he's an, account he's an accountant, but he's also good at, <laughs> he is an accountant actually, but he's really good at consolidating businesses together. He's really good at grouping businesses together. So I went to Patrick and said, hey Patrick, let's do this. A year later, we grouped together um, a lot of smaller media companies, and I'm proud to say in Malaysia, in our country, we're in the top five largest websites with the largest reach, according to Comscore. The only three sites that's larger than our group is Google, Facebook, and Yahoo. And Yahoo, I would say, not for long. This company, uh, we're going to take it public, um, so the wheels are in motion. Um, there probably are laws against me soliciting and hyping up the stock or something, so I, I'm just going to stop right there. Uh, <laughs> but the... <laughs> so that... Uh, and that was a... And so what, what just happened? What just happened there? What just happened was, a lot of times when we're so fixated on our vision of our company, that same fixation and the vision can also be what's getting us stuck. Visions, just like humans, just like life, they're evolving things. They evolve. And to put any hindrance, to, to stop and, and block its evolution 
is a terrible idea. Sometimes you just gotta allow things to flow. Sometimes you gotta hold it tight, you gotta hold it strong, you gotta hold it firm, keep it clear. But sometimes things evolve as well. And kind of knowing when your vision is kind of at a certain level when it needs to evolve, entertain the idea just for five minutes. You'll never know what kind of options get created. So last year, if some of you were here um, at uh, it was AFES, at last year's AFES, I told you a story about <clears throat> an app. So uh, my girlfriend, Cinch, over there, she's got this app called um, Watch Over Me. So it's a personal safety app which um, if you can turn it on, and if, if you're in danger and you can't reach your phone, like the, it will send an emergency alert to your loved ones. Well, that vision evolved. It started off from a personal safety app, but when she sat down and she thought about, what if you don't know you need to turn the app on? What if you're here in Phuket and you, went, you, 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 go in, you, you, you rented a the motorcycle and you're just driving around the streets? Or you're just walking around a market? How would you know that street had three robberies in the past week? Like, you wouldn't know. Well, how, do you, how would you know if you're traveling in Barcelona and this is a main street, but the side street that you're taking a shortcut to is a very dangerous street? You might not know. So her company's mission has evolved to say, okay, we're not just going to alert loved ones when you're in trouble. We're going to be preemptive to prevent you from going into a troublesome area. So her vision is put a safety rating on every street in the world. That... The evolution from a safety app to something which gives you a safety rating on every street, one day we'll be able to walk the world where we get alerted if it's a dangerous street and we can turn on, watch over me and say, okay, protect me for 10 minutes. And if anything happens, then the phone's going to automatically send an alert out so people come and get you. So that's an example, again, of a vision evolving. And you can see a lot of ways companies uh, evolve beyond their mission. Look at Google, what was the search engine? Look at it now, they're like self-driving cars and all that stuff. You look at... <coughs> I, I know maybe Coca-Cola is not a popular example, but you know, it's like it was a drink, right? But now they're like a beverage company. They've got mineral water, they've got other kind of alternative non-sugary drinks as well. Like a lot of companies, it's just in the nature of visions to evolve. So if you are sitting there right now and you, and you have a vision in your mind, now imagine if it's fully fulfilled. When that vision is fully fulfilled, what if it was a small piece of a bigger picture? So how can you be part of that bigger, bigger picture? If you can write that down and just give it five minutes to think about it. My argument is that you're going to have this influx of ideas, of ways that your vision can grow. Especially if you've stuck with a certain vision for a couple of years, you might want to do this exercise once a year maybe, just to see how big that goes. So, I've covered three stories. I've covered three signals to detect that you're stuck. First one was language. When you keep repeating the language of avoidance, it's not my job, it's not my job, I hate that, oh, I don't want that. Language. The second one is your actions, where you repeatedly do a lot of the same things all the time. It just becomes habit, you don't even notice it, but you're getting same, the similar results from it. The third one is that it's in your ambition. You fixate so much on your dream that that dream holds you back and it stops growing. When you look at these three things, they're not overly complex ideas. These are just dimensions of reality. We're looking at your thoughts, your words, and your actions. Three simple ways that you can detect whether or not you're stuck. And with this, I'd like to say that if in this room, hundreds of people in this room, if you guys just unstuck yourself, 50% faster than you otherwise would. Multiply that by the hundreds of you in this crowd and the missions you're on. What we do today to unstuck ourselves is going to change this world forever. And that's not an understatement. Now over to you, your move. Thank you very much.